Okay, today I want to give you a guide of how you can design a clean architecture. But before I start, just a few words about myself. My name is Markus Biel. I'm a clean code evangelist. And besides lots of other stuff, I do work as a clean code coach and a Java consultant. By the way, I have here some stickers, so after my talk, if you want them, of the Java Duke, just come and you can grab one. Okay, so when we talk about the architecture of a system, we usually do so by standing in front of a whiteboard. So for this purpose, let's assume this is here or that, our whiteboard, right? And we're all a huge team of developers. After all, we're agile, right? <laughs> so that seems to be the perfect size for an agile team. Okay, so, and when we look at the architecture of our system, from my personal experience, we usually do so by looking at these boxes here that describe of how the system looks like and how it's connected. So if we look at it, my pointer unfortunately is not working. So maybe I just go over there. So I, I think that in essence is a clean architecture because you can, without knowing any further details, you can see like, you can understand the flow of the system. Something is starting in the bottom, it's going up and it's ending there down in the bottom. Something else is also starting there in top and everything is ending there. So I think that in essence is a clean architecture, high level of course. And also, it is what I usually see when we look at the average architecture. So it seems like the average architecture is a clean architecture. So we can stop here. <laughs> happy, happy, everything is good. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> as you might have guessed, the reality is a bit different. When I talk more in detail with the developers, or I look deeper into the code myself, I have to find out what we really have is a big tangled mess, a big ball of mud, how we call it. And so, why is that so? Why is it that we look at this when actually we mean that? For this I see two reasons. First of all, well, it might actually even be true on a very high level of abstraction, but I mean, to me that is more like a lie because First thing, an architecture is more than just the high level. An architecture is each and every detail. If you look at house architecture, also there's interior design, there's all these details and we have to get everything right and not just the highest level. The second reason for this is, well, it might be a matter of time. When we started the project as a greenfield project, well, first of all, everything was quite simple and easy, right? We just had a few features. So it might have been that it started like this and it was actually true. And remember, we're agile, so the business people, it's their job to add features, and they're really good in that. So they add lots of lots of features into our backlog, and then we're agile, we have to push, we have to be fast, and we kick, kick, we put all the features, we add all of them, and then sooner or later, we end up like this. And even if we start from scratch again, it usually again, happens to be like this. So it seems like there is no escape from that. And well, so at this I want to look today, how can we fix that? So first of all, I see architecture is about boxes and these connections. So I think there in essence is something that we have to get right. And that to me is all about modularity. Modularity, I mean, I'm not so picky with words, so I would also call it divide and conquer, right? It's the same thing. This is how we, I mean, this, this is not only limited programming, but this is how generally how we as humans solve problems. We have a huge problem that is too hard to digest directly, and so we split it up into smaller subunits, recursively, each subunit again until it's really simple to solve. To illustrate this, I put here this image of the little boy playing with Lego cubes. I think Lego is a great example of modularity because one Lego cube doesn't do much. But putting a lot of Lego cubes together makes this concept so super powerful. It's easy enough that this little boy can play and understand Lego, but it's also powerful enough that even adults play with Lego and we can build up statues a few meters high, right? 
So, and if we look at a programming language like Java, or any kind of modern programming language actually, but of course in our case we would look at Java. Well, Java itself is modular to the core. Here if we look at this hierarchy, we have methods, classes, packages, and now with Java 9, hooray, we even have Java 9 modules. By the way, at this time I want to mention, within this talk I will obviously speak of modules a lot. And that might be confusing. The question is, is, am I speaking about the general concept or about specifically Java 9 modules? To differentiate the two, I'll, when I speak about modules, I really mean Java 9 modules. When I speak just about the concept, I'll speak about a component or a unit, something like this, okay? So, okay, back to our hierarchy, one sec. Well, you might disagree with me and say, well, this is layers. But again, I'm not so picky with words. Layers is just the same concept. We split up something and make it better digestible. And you can also see here, I think, well, we have modules on top, and then comes packages, classes, methods. Well, everything, like modules, consists of several packages usually. And a package usually consists of several classes. And yet again, cl a class usually consists of several methods. So I think that shows that actually the small things are the things that matter the most. I mean, again, it's, it's not so simple. We have to look at everything. But the methods will be the unit that occurs the most. So it's really important that we take care about that first and not just about the highest level. That's a nice start. Okay, so now I want to just give you a sneak peek of what we're trying to achieve in the very end of this talk. So assume talk is over we will have discussed a lot about building blocks to achieve a clean architecture. And then when you're back in the office, you probably want to start right now to implement your clean system. And when you do that, you would usually need some kind of an architectural approach of how you start, of how you implement your system. For this, I personally would recommend you to use hexagonal architecture, or at least to take it into consideration. If you do know about hexagonal architecture, that's great. But for this talk, it's not required. Everything that is required, I will tell you right now. It's not much. But anyway, I've put there the bit.ly link, and pointer is still not working. I can't show you. But I guess you see it anyway. So uh, I would highly recommend you to, to go to that link. After the talk, I'll share my slides. Or you take a picture and have a read about hexagonal architecture. Because I really think this can help us to achieve a clean architecture. Okay, so now, why is that so? Well, first of all, hexagonal architecture, like any kind of architecture, is a layered architecture. And here we have them again, layers, right? So layers to split up the complexity to make it better digestible. And here we have two layers. We have an infrastructure layer. This one contains all the technical details. And we have a domain layer. This contains all the domain logic. So this is also highly related to domain-driven design. Another password, sorry. So again, I hope you know about domain-driven design. If so, great. If not, within the talk, I will, whenever necessary, explain what you need. But please do me a favor, read about domain-driven design. There's a book from Eric Evans and many more in the meantime that you should really have a look at. Okay. So what is important now for us? We have these two layers. And oh, it's working again. Something is wrong with the monitor. So we have these two layers, and the question now is, like, how can we ensure that we don't end up in the same mess that we like, ended up last time, right? How can we make this better this time? We have to technically enforce that it's not possible that all these dependencies leak in. And to, to achieve that, we use Java 9 modules. We can make each layer its own Java 9 module, and this way we'll make sure that it's technically enforced, that it's not possible that um, any dependency leaks in, in a way that we were not intending it to be. So what we want here is the infrastructure layer should know about the domain. Obviously only through very well-defined interfaces, which is visualized with a black border. But the domain should know nothing about the technical details. I mean, after all, we are paid by some business, right? So the business is what really matters. The infrastructure we need, obviously it's an uh, evil need, but 
customer doesn't really care that much about stuff like database, HTTPS, and so on, right? They want to run their business. So these both things will change for different reasons at different times. So it's and also logically for us as humans, because we have a problem with the complexity, it's really wise to keep them separately. This will really simplify a lot. And here, hexagonal architecture can help us a lot. So what else do we see here? So you see the outside communicates with, um, with all the technical details. And we also see this blue hexagon there on the bottom. This is just uh, a little draft of me to give you a hint of how you could, would you ever need so, and I hope you would not, scale this monolithic architecture to a microservices architecture, because we could use the exact same approach to scale this up to a microservices architecture. I will not talk about this in the talk further, because I would hope we would not need that to make it as simple as possible. I mean, microservices are just a tool. They're not good or bad, but they add complexity. And for me, as a clean coder, I will fight any kind of unneeded complexity. So if we don't need that, that's great. But if you are Google, let's just assume, then this would be also a way how you could scale this up. OK. So enough about this. So now let's go to the building blocks, the actual knowledge that we need to achieve a clean architecture. This is just a selection, just a few ones that I want to talk about. The topic, of, of course, of architecture, of clean architecture, is much, much bigger. So just to name two that I was not able to talk about in this talk, but that I think that are at least equally as important, one would be testing. And when I say testing, Obviously, I mean unit testing. And when I say testing, the fact that a test might show me a bug, to me, is just a side effect. I use unit testing, again, as a tool, as an indicator to show me, is this testable? Is it maintainable? Is this clean? Is this readable? Is this understandable? So the test will really help me towards achieving a clean architecture. But this topic itself is big. I would do an entire talk on that, so we'll not talk about that further, but still, just be sure this does not mean it's not important. It's super important. And the second thing that I will not talk about today is all the social topics. To me, actually, they are probably the most important ones, because often after my talk, I'm approached by people, and they would say, OK, great, all this stuff that you told us about, but in my company, I have this very specific case, and there, I don't have a standing. Like, whatever I say, they don't follow me. They don't do that. And I can't achieve anything. Well, if that's the case, if that's the case for me, I can't achieve anything either, right? So you have to get the social things right first. When that is not working, then nothing is working. So that must always be the base. And on this assumption, I will tell you everything else. We are in a healthy environment. Everything is good. And we can make changes. And we should make changes. OK. so. Now I want to talk about size. Size really matters, pun intended. And when I speak about size, I obviously speak of small size. A clean architecture is always about managing complexity. Because we humans, I repeat that, have a problem with complexity. So we have to manage, we have to tackle that to make it easier. But that is not always as easy. And often, it comes with some side effects, as I'll show you in my talk. But the cool thing is, small size means simplicity. And when we speak of simplicity, simplicity is the opposite of complexity, obviously. So there, we get this for free. We don't have to manage something that is not there. So therefore, always stay pragmatic, keep it simple. And for the size, like keep your methods as small as possible, classes, packages, keep all your units as small as ever possible. To just give you one hint, for example, my personal preference, but this doesn't matter much, as I'll tell you in a second, would be a class, maybe 50 lines, so really small. But this doesn't really matter. That's my personal opinion. What I would recommend you to do is, in your team, define upper limits for each of these uh, levels. And this should not be like a rule. I know whenever something is defined in a team, then this is a rule. And when this real rule is violated, then people will die, right? Yeah. 
That is not what should be done, right? Our goal is not to have a class of 50 lines. This is just a pragmatic way to achieve our goal. Our goal is maybe to achieve a clean architecture, but in the first place, our goal would probably be to make our clients happy. So we should look at this goal and keep that in mind, and then everything else can be, if necessary, thoughtfully changed if needed. So if you have a method and you violate your own defined rule, and if you have a test and it's testable, and it's still maintainable, understandable, everyone in the team is fine with that, this is okay, not a problem. So I'm not saying everything must, must, must be like this. The first and foremost rule is to stay pragmatic and simple. So never keep that out of sight, okay? And this is how I would use size as an indicator, just like tests. Okay, so second, naming. Naming is also super important to achieve a clean architecture. And initially, I showed you this diagram, this hierarchy, and I think the lowest level was uh, our methods. Well, I was actually lying to make it simpler, this graphic. Even below that would be names, because everything has a name. So that is the one thing that happens the most. And if the name of whatever component, class or method or whatever, is not clear, then we will have huge problems. Because again, it's us humans to understand something. So if you have a component and you call it general utils, what will general utils contain? Let's have a guess. We don't know any code. The first thing before you see the code is the name. So general is probably something. And utils is helping with something. So this is really something, something. <laughs> and you might have started that, you know, we're agile, we're under pressure, we don't have time, we have to fulfill our, uh, our goal. So you might have started that with the best uh, intentions and you were sure you would fix that and rename that, but it never happened so. And now, I don't know, let's say 20 sprints later, another person, maybe even you, look for some new code to live in. Let's say, this is my favorite example, it's car related. So now where could this car, this new car related code li uh, live like? Well, probably general utils is a perfect space, right? And that is exactly what happens. These classes, they grow and grow and grow. And yeah, this is not what a clean architecture is about. So architecture is also something about time, right? It's not enough to do that once, happy, happy, you have the perfect architecture, you can go home and everything is good. It's the same like shaping our bodies, right? If you don't continuously shape our bodies, we will get fat one day or later. Yeah, so if on the other side, you have a really clean name, like account number, what would you guess account number contains? Well, probably logic related to an account number. Same for customer, what would it contain? Well, probably logic related to customers. And the service classes, Please be really careful with them. I mean, I do use service classes, obviously, they're good, they're a good tool, but they're also very powerful, and powerful is usually also dangerous. Because let's assume now we have a car service. Well, a car service is much better than general utils, right? Seems to be related to car. But so car service is offering a service to cars. Well, what service could that be? Maybe creating a car, destroying a car, Buying a car, renting a car, selling a car, painting a car, I don't know, everything. And that again, from my personal experience, is exactly what happens. It started very small, and then it grows and grows and grows over time. So, please, there you have to touch the code, you have to refactor the code. I know, again, that gets social, I fear to touch the code because I will be punished. Yeah, so anyway, clean names are also teamwork, and here, we're touching now domain-driven design. In domain-driven design, we speak of the ubiquitous language. Speaking of good names, I don't think that ubiquitous language is a good name because for me also as a non-native English speaker, it's even hard to speak this out. So even though the word is a bit awkward, at least I personally think so, it's very super simple. It's just about having common names that everyone in your team understands and uses. And when I say users, I say, I mean, use every time and everywhere. First of all, obviously in the code, in all the meetings, in all the discussions, in front of the whiteboard, 
in the middle of the night at the coffee machine with your wife or husband, whatever. You have, this really has to be in everyone's brains and everyone has to agree on that. This is your, your, your driver that will drive you towards a common goal. And this really is magic if it's working. Obviously, this is not easy because finding the perfect name generally is not easy because it has to be so very specific. And it's also very difficult because obviously we're working in some kind of a business and there we need a lot of knowledge about the business to understand. And when you join a new company, you would hope that they put a big book on your desk, you can read that book, you have all the knowledge and now you know everything. Well, unfortunately, that's not the case. The knowledge will be spread over several sources and even more important, it will be spread over several people. And here we get social again, because this knowledge is the sacred value of those people. They might work in the company much longer than you, 10, 20 years, whatever. So why, if you are the new girl or guy in the team, why would they want to give you that knowledge? So they really have to make them open up to you. They have to be at least some, something like a friend so that they agree that they share this knowledge with you. You have to, like, there will, several, there will even be several people and they might be disagreeing with each other. So you have to find compromises, you have to discuss this. You have to discuss this in the team. That is not easy. And to make it worse, we're speaking of a moving target because assuming that the business you're working in is a successful business, well, obviously the world changes. So if the world changes, then the business has to change. And if the business is changing, then we have to change. Our code has to change. So whatever was perfect today will not be perfect tomorrow. So again, sorry, this is constant work. Okay, so you have to rename your entities whenever you get new insights, because you will also not get this right the first instant. This will be really hard, and this will get better and better over time. Okay, so yeah, you see I get a bit emotional because naming is really important to me. Okay, so now, I want to talk about encapsulation. So what is encapsulation? That's actually a very interesting question. I found out it's not so easy to answer, so I give you just my definition. So encapsulation to me is the implementation of information hiding. And it's also about abstraction. And when I say abstraction, again, it's about simplification. And this is why encapsulation can help us so much. But the cool thing is encapsulation is way more than that. Because encapsulation also technically enforces of how the system should be used. And that's the thing that we use with Java 9 modules, right? By using the way of how Java 9 modules encapsulate a module, in our case, as I said, when we use the hexagonal architecture and we make each layer its own module, we can encapsulate, we can forbid that the domain layer could ever touch the infrastructure layer. Because that is, again, some, a tool for us humans. Computers don't need that. You tell them once, they will do. For us, telling us once will not do, right? So here, the compiler will help us. If we try otherwise, there will be a problem for us. Okay, so and this is encapsulation. And sometimes I even heard encapsulation was about getters and setters. Interesting. Took me really long to understand that. In the very end, I found out I never understand this because it's, it doesn't make sense to me. I hope you can agree on that. Some would disagree. For this reason, again, I put a, very, a link with a very long article where in detail I explain well, I really don't like getters and setters. Well, I think they violate encapsulation because if you have, for example, if we're speaking on a class level and you have a private modifier. Well, we made this private because we want to program object-oriented, right? We want to think in functionality. We don't want to think in data. This is why we make the attributes private. So why would we then provide public getters and setters that can directly access, even modify these fields again? Where's the difference in just making them public? So, and even if you have some stupid simple DTU, well, you might make the fields public instead. That's still better than providing stupid getters and setters, right? So, hmm. okay, so enough about my rant about getters and setters. And last but not least, I want to speak about the package and private modifier. 
that's really a cool thing. But unfairly, it's not used very much. Well, it's not used very much, I think, because it's there, it's the default. It's there when we don't put any visibility modifier. And the problem here is it's not clear. The intention of us is not clear because we are humans, we make, we make mistakes, so sometimes we just forget to add the modifier, and sometimes we do this on purpose. So how would the next developer know? So if you use package in private and do use it, then add a comment specifically stating why you put package private there, give your reasons. I'm also not a big friend of documentation, but this would be an exception to the rule, stating the why you put package private there, so that not the next developer fixes <laughs> your nice thing and uh, yeah, gets rid of that. To just give you a quick example of why we would want to use package in private, well, I'm driving a BMW and from time to time I have to run or there needs to be an inspection. I don't know much about cars, so I would go to some garage. Now, if I have a method public inspection, then anyone in the whole world could run the inspection on my car. And that's maybe not the best idea. So in this case, it's maybe better to make this method package private. And now if I put my BMW class in a BMW package, then only the BMW engineer can use it. So that might help here. OK, so that much about encapsulation. Now I want to talk about coupling and cohesion. These are really the big guys, as I hope I can show you. OK, so coupling. For the purpose of this talk, I would assume you're all senior developers and you already have a good understanding of what coupling is, so this will be a bit short. So just to repeat, we try to avoid tight coupling, uh, tight coupling sorry, and we try to achieve a loosely coupled system. So to visualize that, oh, my pointer is not working, but what a shame. So to visualize that um, here in a tightly coupled system, no, we have many, many connections, and in a loosely coupled system, we just have a bare minimum of connections. So it seems like coupling is about connections, and it's about the number of connections. That is true, but it's not everything. It's also about the strength of the connection. I try to again visualize that by here making very, very strong solid lines, and in a loosely coupled system, very thin dotted lines. So if we have two components, we have to look at how specifically are these two components communicating with each other. So that is something that we should look at more closely. Okay. So this topic itself is huge. I found books from like 60 years ago that talk about this for hundreds of pages. So here only very short, a few examples of what uh, matters when we look at the strengths of the coupling. The first thing is the type of the coupling. Okay, so the question is, when we look at the type of the coupling, for instance, how many parameters are being sent and or received? Are we just speaking of a very simple string? Or are we speaking of a very complex parameter, a collection of very complex objects? And are we speaking of many parameters? And are we sending or are we sending and receiving? So the more data is being sent and received, obviously, the more complex things get. Well, there, there are some limitations. We can't design everything, obviously, because we have to implement what the business needs. But it's also not true that we can't do uh, nothing. Obviously, we can influence that, and we can strive towards a very loose coupling, and we should. And if you look at a method level, for example, this is why you, uh, you might be obviously aware of we should have methods with very few parameters. Well, the reason is, the, few, the fewer parameters you have in your method, the looser the coupling will be, the more simpler everything will be. Okay, so, and the next thing that I want to talk about is the distance of the components. Because the question is, if we have two com components that are coupled, on which level are we? Are we speaking of two very small methods in the same class, very closely related? Or are we speaking of two very huge modules, not so much related? The higher in the hierarchy we are, the more code is involved usually, and the more people are involved. And obviously, again, this is about complexity. So the more complex it gets, also the more risky it gets, and we have to manage this somehow. And therefore, phone call, therefore we should strive 
for the most loosest form of coupling in the highest levels of our hierarchy. Well, obviously, we should always strive for loose coupling, but as I'll show you in the next slides, sometimes this might come at a price, and we might not want to pay this price of the loosest form of coupling, so we have to make an informed decision. And when we have to make this decision, usually in the highest levels, we would probably go for the very loose form of coupling, while in the uh, more lower levels, a more tighter, tighter not tight, uh, form would be acceptable. Okay, so to illustrate this, here, um, I hope you can see it, because last time I was told you could just see two blue uh, circles. They are both blue, obviously, but they are blue in a slightly different shape. So what I want to illustrate here is, this is code, very closely related, and let's just assume it's two small, stupid methods, right? And they both use this black dot, so that should mean they're using duplicated code, they're violating the principle of dry. That's evil, right? We shouldn't do that. Because this will make problems. Because, well, if we duplicate the code, we have to maintain this twice, we have to test this twice, and so on. Yeah, so let's fix this. Now, instead of duplicating the code, they're both sharing this code. Okay, great, problem fixed. Well, it's not so easy, because here is what I told you. Sometimes it comes at a price, because now, we coupled these two components, and this might also be a problem, because I said we should avoid the coupling, right? Now the question is, in our specific case, is that a problem or not? Now let's just assume in this specific case where we are on a lower level, very small stupid methods, it's not a problem, right? But what if we have a lot of components and a lot of large components, modules for instance, right? In this case, well, in uh, domain-driven design, we would speak, it could be in different bounded contexts. So if they're all sharing the same component, that could be a big pain, because again, each module, I would assume, changes for different reasons at different times. And now what might have been the same in the, in the center might not be the same in the future, and that might be a nightmare in maintenance. So in this case, we have to make a decision. There is no good, uh, right and wrong. We just have to like, take the lesser evil of the two. So in this case, it might be better to duplicate the code than to share it, okay. So, and the last factor that I want to talk about um, in relation to the strength of the coupling is the timing of the coupling. The question is, well, we can couple two components at runtime or at compile time. Well, obviously, the later we do that, the better, the more flexibility we get, and we love flexibility, right? Great. So let's use dependency inversion. Dependency inversion, I guess pretty much everyone understood, and everyone loves it. We love dependency inversion. Great. Well, wait. Thing is, if we couple something at uh, runtime, for example, in the last second on production, right? This is a great flexibility, but if there's a problem in the coupling of the two components, we might see this problem only on production, and that might be not so cool. So here again, we have to make a decision. In the case of our hexagonal architecture, where I said we have the two layers, and we make the modules, and the modules should be really loosely connected, there I would probably use dependency inversion. But I would not use it everywhere and under all costs. I would just, you know, you have to make an informed decision. And a clean architecture is always about making informed decisions, not just using a tool like a hammer because it's cool, yeah. Okay, so, that much about coupling. Now, let's come to cohesion. Out of all the building blocks that I've talked so far, to me, cohesion is really the big one. This is really the cornerstone of a clean architecture. Why? To answer this, first of all, I might have to clarify what actually is co cohesion, because I had to find out few developers have actually heard this term. But many developers have heard about um, the um, single responsibility principle. Well, the single responsibility principle, interesting, uh, interestingly enough, was coined in 2002. The term cohesion was termed about 60 years ago. It's 99% the same thing. Single responsibility principle just focuses on a class level, cohesion focuses on all levels. But the general concept, the general idea is the same thing. It's about the responsibilities 
the functionalities, the activities within one component, right? How are they organized, sorted, grouped, right? And so it's about structure. And architecture, isn't that about structure as well? So I think architecture and cohesion, they follow exactly the same thing. Well, this is why achieving a really high cohesive system to me is the essence of achieving a clean architecture. I try to again visualize this here with colors, right? So in our highly cohesive system, we have those blue colors nicely together, the green colors, the yellow colors, everything looks nice, right? While in low cohesive system, it's all a bit disorganized, not so easy to see even graphically. Yeah, and this is already hard for our eyes, right? It gets more complex, but there is more. Actually, if we assume, let's just say for this purpose, that now our blue circle, pick any, one of the blue circles, um, or all the blue circles are related to car logic, and let's say one is related to a wheel, another one is related to a steering wheel, and a third one is related to an engine. Well, obviously, they have to talk to each other, right? And if we spread this functionality over our, our entire system, this will lead to a lot of coupling. So this is why um, if you have a lowly uh, a cohesive system, this usually tends also towards a very tight coupling. This is not entirely true, because coupling, as I showed you, is more. It's not only about the connections, it's also about the strengths of the connections, and we can further influence that. So it's not enough to just focus on cohesion. We have to focus on cohesion and coupling. But if I would have to start with one, I would focus more or first on cohesion, because this will set us in the right direction. Okay, so. Now, I didn't say yet, like, how can we achieve high cohesion? And that's actually very, very hard. And that's probably also why this is late, uh, the last thing that I talk about, because this is, I wish, you know, I could give you a rule. First, second, third, this is how you do it, and you know, and you follow this rule, and it's done. But this is not possible in this case. Why? Because high cohesion, I said, is about sorting, grouping. And when we sort something, we have a criteria that we sort by, right? So the criteria that we should usually sort by is related to business logic. And so we need, again, as I spoke about before, a lot of knowledge about the domain that we work in. And as I already said, this is so hard to get right. This is so hard to achieve. This is constantly changing. So this is nothing we can get right in five minutes. And this is nothing that I could teach you in this talk. This is something that you continuously, for the rest of your career, or specifically speaking of a system, obviously for the rest of the life of the system, you have to work on. And this requires a lot of hard work and passion. Yeah. Okay, and now, with this quote, I want to close. David Parnas said, I would advise students to pay more attention to the fundamental ideas rather than the latest technology. The technology will be out of date before they graduate. Fundamental ideas never get out of date. Okay, thanks. Now, if you have questions, go ahead. Okay, if there's no question, if you want to pick stickers, you can grab them here. And if you want to, like, later ask me something in private, you will find me outside and you can ask anything, right? <laughs>